me uh, uh, to, to give a guest lecture. Uh, she requested me to present something on printed microfluidics and biosensors. Uh, I, I scope it down a little bit uh, to uh, something I'm more comfortable with. So uh, without further ado, um, let's let's start the, this morning lecture. Um, if anyone has any questions at any end of time, uh, you can just step in and ask me a question uh, if, if you do have one. Okay, Bismillah. Why is this not? Okay, so the outline for today, uh, firstly, I will introduce you to uh, a general sense of what microfluidics and biosensors are. Then I'll give you uh, some examples of low cost methods uh, when people do fabrication in printed sensor fluidics, and examples uh, when you integrate both uh, sensors and microfluidics. And finally, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the work that we do here at IIUM. Introducers you're working with, um, and then you attach uh, biological probes on top of it. Uh, this could be enzymes or antibodies or antigens or aptamers or uh, uh, or nucleic acid. Or uh, recently, people use molecular molecular imprinted polymers. So these are uh, recognition probes for whatever analyte that we're looking at. So essentially, a biosensor is uh, these two uh, elements being put together. Today, we want to focus on electrodes because uh, that's the, uh, that is the most uh, the the ones that's most suitable for printed techniques. So usually, electrodes when you have electrodes as sensors, it's for traction by electrochemistry. Uh, or capacitive sensing. Uh, some people do it for potentiometry, colometry, or impedimetry. Uh, sometimes for piezoelectric sensing uh, and diatrophosis, and also uh, for Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy is an optical technique, but it also uses metal electrodes. Uh, I, I won't go further into Raman, uh, but today we'll focus mostly on electrochemistry and some of capacitive sensing. Um, then I will introduce you a bit microfluidics. So there are different types of microfluidic devices. Uh, in sensor context, usually the reason you want to have microfluidics in your sensor because it enables you to automate uh, your sample prep. Uh, you can parallelize your reactions or manage and miniaturize the whole the whole uh, integrated sensor. Uh, basically, it's for liquid handling at the micro scale. Um, in other words, it's more like an advanced micro pipette, if you could say it that way. Um, so some examples of uh, microfluidics techniques, uh, you can, uh, there's droplet microfluidics, so they make uh, uh, droplets. Um, capillary flow is in continuous flow. So uh, here you can see that it's it's in micro microliter in a microliter to nanoliter uh, scale, but it's continuous it's, uh, in droplets. Uh, digital microfluidics, uh, you can control droplets, uh, indiv ad address, in address droplets individually, and you move it using uh, electrokinetic uh, forces. And also centrifugal microfluidics, uh, it, you, you move the liquid through rotational forces. So uh, why do we use microfluidics for liquid handling uh, when we work with sensors? Uh, because uh, there are situations where sometimes microfluidics can do things that you can, we cannot do with micropipettes or difficult to do with micropipettes. Some of these examples 
it can paralyze hundreds of individual chemical reactions in, in a single platform, um, or you can generate uh, millions of polymer emulsion droplets per, per minute. Um, and also uh, another example is you want to move, uh, you, you want to run reactions while the liquids are inside uh, and, and uh, a near magnetic resonance spectrometer. So usually when, when NNMR is, is running, usually you don't go and uh, touch, uh, you, you don't, you can't really handle the liquid inside unless you have some sort of uh, uh, mechanism to move the liquid around. In biased context, uh, so in biased context, the microfluidic portion uh, will integrate sample prep into the sensor device. So a lot of people, when they work on sensor and sensor only, um, the, the, a lot of the sample handling, so things like DNA extraction, um, CR, whatnot, you do it tip, um, which means you do it annually. Um, with, microflu with microfluidic biosensors, you can integrate the methods uh, into the sensor itself. So uh, here's two examples. So uh, this one is uh, recent uh, from Purdue Univer University. So I, I colored the microfluidic, por uh, microfluidic portion in blue. So this part, uh, I did a viral RNA extraction. Uh, using the microfluidics and then it amplifies the RNA using a lamp assay and then the sensor part will measure the viral load. And in the second example, um, you, you load a human serum sample into the device and the device will split the human serum sample into four equal volumes and then you will extract four different biomarkers and then purify the biomarkers and then it adds a uh, label secondary antibody. And then finally, the sensor uh, measures the biomarker uh, titer concentration. So that's about biosensors and microfluidics. And now, now we focus on low cost. The um, reason why we do low cost uh, techniques for fabricating uh, sensors and microfluidics is because R&D is expensive. Uh, a, lot, a lot of these techniques involve uh, instruments or combinations of instruments that are uh, that cost uh, more than six figures ringgit. Um, uh, Prof. Azza mentioned that last week uh, everyone uh, has gone through uh, a guest lecture on clean room based fabrication. So clean rooms are expensive to build. Uh, they, they usually cost millions to build the facility and then you want to set up the equipment, uh, buy the equipment and set up the, the facility. Um, rentals around uh, Malaysia typically cost between 5k to 15k per year, not including uh, the fees of using each equipment uh, per use. So that is fairly uh, expensive. Um, there's an option of using multi-material inkjet printer. So these are in the price range of hundred. Uh, these are also fairly expensive. What it does, it's a, it's a real, it's an advanced uh, printer. So our home printers can print ink. Uh, Multi-material inkjet printers can print uh, metals, can print uh, cells. So, uh, so vers it's fairly, it's very versatile, but also quite costly. Um, uh, next one is magnetron sputtering coder. Uh, most people who has done scanning electron microscopy would be familiar with uh, with a sputter coder. Um, this one's in the range of uh, 60k up to uh, the the more advanced. How do I say this? So the smaller ones uh, are around 60k. Uh, you can find this online, but also the the more expensive ones can go uh, uh, a lot more expensive, and that's for larger. Uh, devices and more advanced uh, purpose. And uh, because these are expensive, uh, people look for methods for uh, low cost prototyping for sensors and microfluidics. Uh, some of the common tools that we use uh, for low cost techniques 
um, the first point here is a CNC milling router. Essentially, it's like a drill, like a small drill that you can uh, control, uh, that you can program uh, digitally. Then there's a cutter plotter tool. So this one cuts uh, thin. This one cuts things like stickers, uh, paper, um, and plastic sheets. Um, a laser cutter, uh, it, it, as you can see here, it shoots a laser and burns the burn the material. Um, and then two different types of uh, 3D print, 3D printers. Uh, this one is the one that we uh, call the first one called fused deposition modeling. Um, it uses a filament, uh, and you print uh, layer by layer. The next one is stereolithography. Uh, it uses a resin, which is photo photo curative. So it uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so it uses UV. It uses UV light to photo cure a resin. Um, that forms the shape of the uh, printed material. Um, okay, does anyone has any questions so far? No? Excuse me for a bit. Okay. So next we will go uh, through some examples of uh, low cost printed sensors, uh, some, some uh, examples of techniques that people use for low cost printed sensors, some definitions. So printed electrodes are 2D or 3D material that conducts electricity. Um, in a sense, uh, the techniques that we use to print electrodes and uh, techniques that we use for printed circuit are interchangeable. The difference is an electrode uh, the electrode is a portion that has surface interaction with the analyte environment. So usually you modify an electrode with enzymes or uh, or you add um, probes onto it. Some common materials in low cost techniques um, are carbon so or carbon derived materials, for example, uh, graphene or graphite. Um, specific kinds of metals, so common metals that we use in co low cost techniques are copper, uh, aluminum, nickel, silver, and gold. And finally, conducting polymers uh, such as P.PSS um, or polyaniline. So the first technique is conductive screen printing. So this, this technique uses uh, uh, conductive paste. So conductive paste uh, can be bought commercially or uh, some people, uh, so, some labs uh, develop base, and you require a mask called a screen to apply the ink uh, onto the support material. So you place the, you put the paste on top of the screen, and then you press press the ink through the the mask uh, so that the mask is transferred onto the substrate. So this is how it typically looks like. Um, and this is also how uh, most commercial screen electrodes that use electrochemistry uh, are made, uh, are fabricated. With. Uh, next, we have conductive inkjet printing. So, conductive inkjet printing uh, is essentially uh, a home printer uh, that has been modified. It's either you modify the home printer, or sometimes people, uh, sometimes companies develop uh, special conductive ink that can be used with home printers um, that can be loaded in the printer. Uh, and these are typically sold together with uh, some special uh, substrate uh, they, or paper. I mean, they call it paper, but sometimes it can. These can be plastic as well. Um, so uh, these papers are typically specially coated so that they can, so that the ink, the conductive ink can stick onto the, the substrate. Some examples of this uh, are, uh, so some examples of 
sensors that people have used uh, using this technique. Uh, they've made a soil moisture sensor. This is from Kawahara, uh, Yoshihiro Kawahara from University of Tokyo. This is also from the same group. Uh, these ones, uh, they make uh, switches and uh, touch, uh, multi-touch sensors, sensors. And these ones are from Wheeler Lab at uh, University of Toronto. Um, they use uh, in conductive inkjet printing to print uh, digital microfluidic devices. So these are electrodes that will be used to actuate uh, the the micro the nanoliter liquids. The next technique is conductive direct ink writing, uh, DIW. So the the I, the concept of this technique is uh, conductive ink is loaded into a pen like carrier, and then you write the circuit. So. When you use it with an electronic plotter, can you can control the design in a sense that you can design it in digitally using a software, and then it uh, it translates to uh, a fabricated sensor. Um, this one is uh, Circuit Scribe. They are commercial commercially available uh, for hobbyists, um, and uh, as in this. This video, you can see that uh, you are, they, they draw the circuit uh, using the pen, and then it completes, it, it becomes uh, a functional circuit. Uh, next technique that I would like to share uh, is laser induced graphene. So, this is a fairly new technique. Uh, it's discovered in 20, it, it was first. The first proof of concept for this technique uh, was uh, demonstrated in 2014. So essentially, you use a carbon dioxide laser. So this is uh, standard laser cutters um, that, that hobbyists use at home. Um, and then when, when you engrave polyimide uh, with, the, with a CO2 infrared laser, it will convert the polyimide into 3D porous graphene. So polyimide is commercially and commonly available uh, as Kapton tape. This is usually, this is common uh, for uh, a lot of electronics application. Skapton is a, is a typical uh, dielectric that's being used for, for uh, printed circuit boards. And laser engravers are common hobbyist tools. So just by drawing, Drawing the sensor by using a laser on top of uh, Kapton tapes, you can turn it into graphene, and graphene is conductive, so it becomes an electrode. And finally, for this section, um, it's, I would like to introduce metal foil patterning. So a lot of foils are, uh, we're, we are familiar with uh, aluminum foils, um, but there are many other kinds of metal foils, such as uh, you get, we have copper foils, you have gold leaves, and also silver leaves. So this technique is by uh, pattern, you pattern the metal foils uh, by cutting it or etching it. Um, and then usually you attach, attach the metal foil uh, and, to a surface uh, using adhesives. So basically double-sided tapes or glue, um, with with removable tapes uh, or uh, removable copper tapes, you can you you can tape it on the surface and then you cut the design and then you can peel off the the negative that we don't we don't require and the remaining part becomes uh, the electrodes. So some examples are here. Uh, so the first example is an electronic skin, and this is by Sinical, uh, uh now at Cornell. Mm. So these uh, these gold these gold electronic skin uh, acts as a capacitive sensor. So this is used as a human uh, as a human computer uh, interaction interface. So they use uh, these tattoos to control uh, they control uh, Internet of Things applications such as. Uh, uh, 
turns it turns the skin into a touch screen or something similar to that. Um, the example in the middle is a gold leaf electrode for electrochemistry. So the the metal foil is uh, taped together in between two Kapton tapes, and then uh, the shape of electrode is being cut out using the uh, through the Kapton tape. Um, and then whatever, whatever portion that is exposed becomes the working electrode for electrochemistry. Um, and this one, this one is from University uh, Technology Malaysia, uh, copper foil antenna. So antenna is uh, a, a type of sensor. It's, it detects electromagnetic fields. So this one is copper foil uh, on fabric. So this makes a wearable uh, antenna. So all the, uh, so, yes. Uh, so this is a, a form of uh, electromagnetic sensor as well. Next, I will go on to uh, some examples of low-cost printed microfluidics. Is everyone with me so far? <laughs> yes, I think. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Focus. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. So microfluidics. Microfluidics uh, is, uh, is fluid carriers and fluid hand handling mechanism. Uh, the dimensions are typically uh, between one micron to one milli millimeters. And the typical volume involved uh, between 100 nanoliters to 10 microliters. Uh, sometimes there are smaller uh, volumes than 100 nanoliters. These are already in the nanofluidic uh, regime. Some common materials in low-cost techniques, uh, firstly, is silicone. So silicone is anything that has a, a oxygen, silicon oxygen bond, so a siloxane group. Some examples are PDMS eco, uh, and Ecoflex. Uh, examples of silicone uh, in daily life uh, include using um, baby bottles, uh, what else? Yes. Um, so, <clears throat> so uh, the next common material that people usually use are, oops, sorry, are thermoplastics. So 2D sheets are thin sheets, for example, uh, PT, uh, polyurethane uh, sheets, and then PVC sheets. Um, and then there are three uh, thicker material, uh, 3D uh, th thicker thermoplastic materials, for example, acrylic plates, um, slightly olefin copolymer plates, and also there's one dimensional thermoplastic, so filament thermoplastic. These are usually used with three printers. Some examples include polylactic acid, PLA, or acrylonitrile butadiene styrene, ABS. Um, Photocurable resins are typically used with stereolithographic. Uh, printers, for example, uh, photosensitive phosphat resins, but also uh, UV nail polish is also a kind of photocurable resin. And people also use papers, dip, uh, different kinds of papers, uh, filter papers, photo papers, tissue papers, um, also, also glass fibers. And finally, people use wax uh, in low cost techniques. <clears throat> So the first technique that I'm going to describe is uh, mold casting. So this, this is based on uh, a common technique that's being used in microfluidics. Um, it's called topography. Topography uh, additionally is dynamic clean rooms, uh, but there are ways to adapt it to non-clean room uh, settings. So what it basically is, it, it's polymerization of base materials, typically silicone, uh, over a, a mold that has been micro pattern. So the technique goes like this. So, so on the leftmost image, there's a six step uh, diagram on how a soft lithography process works. Uh, essentially, there's a master mold, uh, a micro pattern mold here. Then you pour PDMS and then let it cure. Then you can peel off the PDMS, uh, the PDMS uh, sheet. Then uh, 
And then the PDMS sheet uh, is uh, drilled. Uh, you poke holes on it to to have inlet and outlet for your liquid to come in, uh, come in and get go out uh, from the device. Um, and then it's plasma treated. Uh, this is not always, uh, I would say. So plasma treatment uh, is is something that people do with PDMS to to bond it to other PDMS uh, slabs or onto glass. So you do plasma treatment and then you bond it uh, with uh, a different uh, with another slab to 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 com to integrate into a complete device. So the picture in the middle is an example of uh, master molds made with photoresist uh, on silicon wafer. These are made in clean rooms. Um, and the third photo is an example of what a uh, De PDMS device made through soft lithography looks like. So the low cost techniques uh, that people use with mold, cast mold casting is typically is to replace the method that is used to make uh, the master mold, the, the, the one in the first step. So some techniques to replace this uh, master mold fabrication. Uh, here is uh, from a group in Vietnam. They use an, a UV nail polish based mold. So how it essentially how it works is they coat a glass light with UV nail polish. Then they they have a, a printed mask. This is this this is made using this printing printing uh, toner on onto a transparent plastic. And then you expose the UV light. You, you expose the the nail polish to UV light uh, through the mask, uh, which causes uh, the exposed part to solidify, and the rest of them you can just wash away with uh, acetone and ethanol. Um, this way, you get a, a UV nail polish mold which uh, can replace the photoresist mold that's being made in clean rooms. Um, the second method I, I highlight here is from uh, Sagiomo and Velders uh, from Wageningen University, Netherlands. Um, here they 3D print uh, ABS mold. So this is 3D printed uh, with ABS material. So ABS is uh, dissolvable in acetone. So what they did is that uh, they put the scaffold, uh, they immerse it in PDMS and cure the PDMS, and then they dissolve uh, the mold uh, in acetone immersion. This, uh, this is a clever way of how people can make uh, 3D, 3D fluidics inside PDMS easily. So here, for example, uh, they did like a spiral shaped uh, fluidic device uh, Spiral shapes is tricky to make using clean room techniques because clean room techniques are usually <clears throat> uh, stacks of 2D designs. And also here, example D, you can see like they, they made a fluidic maze inside PDMS, uh, which is also very tricky to make uh, using other techniques. Uh, the next technique is laminated microchannels. Um, um, and this can be made using uh, both laser cutting and also zero. So zerography is uh, using a blade to cut uh, patterns onto a, a thin material. So here, microchannels are patterned on sheet materials uh, through laser or blade cutting. So if you look at uh, these examples, uh, each of these uh, layers have uh, cut patterns inside them. And then uh, these uh, separate sheets are laminated together using adhesives. In this first example, this is from uh, uh, James Landers Group at University of Virginia. They laser cut microchannels on PET sheets. And then uh, before they laser cut it, uh, they actually print it uh, just toner. Uh, so, so our typical laser printer, the one that we use at home, um, they just print 
all of the layers uh, with toner, like black, and then they cut the laser. Uh, they cut the, the micro channels using laser, and then they uh, laminate, uh, thermally laminate uh, all these layers. So what the toner does, so what a toner actually is, it's, it's a thermal, uh, it's a thermal plastic. So when, when you heat it, it, it melts a bit and then uh, it, it solidifies. So what, what the lamination process does is that it melts the toner again. And then uh, these toner acts as adhesives in between uh, these individual layers. Um, the second example is a bit more straightforward. Uh, you essentially use a plotter cutter uh, that uh, I showed earlier, a plotter uh, to cut microchannels on PET and, uh, and uh, double-sided tape. So the, the, the microfluidic pattern is actually cut onto, uh, into the, the double-sided tape. And then uh, these separate parts are, laminate, are, are taped together to form a microfluidic devices. So here they have a mixer and a gradient uh, and a gradient generator. So these two uh, these two inputs here, uh, green and orange, eventually turns out to eventually merges into a gradient of uh, colors, and this can be used for for uh, creating uh, dilutions. Uh, and microfluidic devices. The next example, uh, the next technique uh, is uh, engraved microchannels. Uh, this can be done using lasers or through micromilling. So this one is about, it's sort of similar to laminated techniques, but it doesn't cut through the material. Uh, it, it doesn't cut through the material. This one uh, makes patterns that makes cut patterns uh, on, on the, onto the material. So first example here is a micro, micro milling uh, fluidic channels into acrylic sheet. You can see that it's essentially a prog programmable drill, uh, a very small drill that you can program and cut uh, designs into, uh, into a material. Um, the second example is similar, but with different tools. So this one uses laser ablation. So uh, instead of using a micro milling machine, uh, they use lasers. So this device here has both uh, fluidic channels. Uh, you can see here in red, uh, it's, uh, it's microfluidic, cha microfluidic channels. And also these black ones, uh, are electrodes. They're actually carbon paste that's being uh, put into uh, a laser engraved uh, channels onto the acrylic in on the acrylic plate. Next is paper microfluidics. So paper uh, naturally, uh, ha but uh, paper naturally is a wicking material if it's wet it will it will the if there's fluid on top of paper to uh, usually not normally it will wick through the material so if people take advantage of this uh, of this uh, feature uh, some of the most commercially commercially successful paper microfluidic devices are pregnancy tests home pregnancy tests uh, which is essentially a paper script that has enzymes uh, printed into it. So microfluidic flow, uh, well, uh, mi the microfluidic flow is caused by capillary action within the paper, um, but you can uh, make two-dimensional networks uh, of uh, fluid flow into the paper. Uh, you can program the paper to, to you can program the fluid flow in the paper uh, can use wax using wax or correction pens uh, or any hydrophobic uh, pattern or, or any hydrophobic pattern. Uh, so for example, uh, they buy a paper fluidic pattern uh, through paper cutting. So here uh, it's essentially they, they 
we cut the fluid channels and and have a radiance on the pad then they activated the the device by placing by wetting the devices and then it will time uh, it, it will time the delivery of the reagents uh, according to uh, the shape of the paper fluidic device um, here and the second example can design paper fluidic patterns uh, using printed wet ink. Uh, this one, this is done using a Xerox Color Cube printer. So Xerox Color Cube uh, is a is a model of printer that doesn't print using uh, uh, liquid ink or toner. Uh, they have a special kind of uh, cartridge where they print uh, colored wax. So sort of like crayons that they melt. Uh, that, that the, the nozzle melts and uh, deposits onto the paper. So this group uh, takes advantage of this uh, takes advantage of this printer to use it to print uh, wax ink uh, into paper devices. And the third example, they use corrections. So uh, later we call this liquid paper uh, can uh, draw uh, fluidic patterns using uh, liquid paper and then uh, by doing this you can program uh, the paper to to control the fluid flow uh, on on the device so next uh, some examples of integrated sensors using low-cost methods so earlier we we went through some uh, examples of printed sensors and then we went through some examples of, uh, of uh, low-cost microfluidics. Uh, so uh, I provide some examples of how we can integrate these two techniques to a functional device. So the first method here, um, this is from Yiran Yang uh, at, Elf, at Caltech. Uh, this is Reason, uh, this published this year. So. In this device, uh, so this is a, a wearable sweat sensor uh, that, sens that senses uh, multiple kinds of biomarkers. So in principle, what this device is, is uh, they use laser-induced graphene electrodes. So earlier we, we, we went through a bit with laser-induced graphenes. Um, makes the sensors on top of uh, polyimide uh, tape. Then you use laser cut microfluidic channels on adhesive sheets, and then they laminate all of this together. Uh, and, and that makes a wearable sweat sensor that can be applied uh, onto, uh, and onto a subject's uh, skin. And then this device measures uh, uric acid and tyrosine. Uh, so these are gout biomarkers. Uh, you measure them from sweat. Um, this one uses electrochemistry method. Um, then can, it can also measure body temperature. Uh, it can also measure uh, heart pulses and also sweat rate. So body temperature is measured using a resistive, uh, it uses a resistive uh, sen sensing approach. Uh, and the heart pulses uses something similar to ECGs. And this device, uh, because it's it's laminated, it, it's a flat laminated device. Uh, it's also integrated into a reader that's being made uh, using uh, flexible PCB uh, techniques. Uh, the next example is from University of Virginia. This is from James Landers Group. Uh, they, uh, they made an electrophoresis uh, automation device for forensic DNA profiling. So this device is made using uh, laser engraved uh, cyclic olefin copolymer sheets. Uh, these ones here. So these are like COC sheets. They're similar to acrylic with slightly different uh, plastic properties. Um, then they laminated, uh, they did laminated adhesive sheets. So these are plastics and adhesives. 
and then some gold leaves uh, electrodes uh, here. So what this does is that if you have done electro electrophoresis before, you know that you have to prepare gels before you run your electrophoresis. So what this does is that it takes in the reagents to, to prepare the gels and it automates the preparation of the gel uh, through centrifugal microfluidics. So once the, the reagents are loaded into the device and then you sp the device is spin, uh, is spun. So when, when the device spins, uh, it prepares the gel. And then after the gel is prepared, uh, the sample are loaded uh, into the into the device, and then uh, you can and then they run electrophoresis through it. So this is fairly high resolution. They can uh, differentiate up to two. Uh, the resolution is down to two nano, sorry, uh, two nucleic uh, two base pairs. So yes, so that that's uh, that's fairly high resolution for for an electrophoresis device. And finally, uh, the last example is uh, what we did at IIUM. So this is uh, the work that I'm currently working on. Uh, this, uh, this is currently unpublished. Um, I, I won't go into too much details on the project, uh, but uh, I think it's, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I'll go to as much detail as so such that uh, everyone could understand how, the concept of what, what we're working on uh, here at IUM. Um, so uh, what we did was that um, we figured that patient sensor and microfluidic um, and when people do uh, when people do come up with low cost devices, some uh, with low cost approaches, sometimes they do a hybrid approach. Uh, they mix it with uh, some expensive uh, tools. For example, uh, some some of them have partially uh, used sputtering machines, um, and some of them uh, use uh, partial uh, partial photoresist techniques, uh, which requires a clean room. So. We set out to assemble uh, a, a method where all of the tools and materials are are fairly cheap um, and accessible. So these, so we put together these eight uh, tools and materials. So the first one is a vinyl cutter. Uh, so this one cuts uh, sheet materials. Uh, program you can program uh, designs to cut. Uh, sheet materials, um, uh, a home use laminator, edible gold leaf. So, a uh, food grade gold leaf is something. Food. So, gold leaf comes with comes in many different uh, qualities. Food grade ones are are especially high purity in gold because uh, because alloys. But because gold is uh, because you cannot. Is the human body cannot uh, the human body cannot digest gold, so that it, that way it doesn't poison the body uh, compared to as gold first. That's what we rate, so that it has high purity. Final stickers or any kind of stickers that's uh, repositionable, uh, something that you can paste and then remove it. Uh, Detector transparency foams. Iron-on stickers. So these are stickers where, if you heat it, uh, the the adhesive becomes active. Um, Double-sided tapes, and also conductive silver pen, uh, as as we've seen earlier. So we use the vinyl sticker to attach. Sorry, we use the vinyl cutter. Uh, to do three things. Firstly, we make silver electrodes by uh, placing the, the, the pen uh, into the plotter uh, carrier in the, in the electronic cutting, cutting plotter machine. Here you can see that you can draw uh, silver electrodes. Then we make microfluidic channels by cutting into a heat and bond 
uh, iron on sticker. And finally, uh, and the third application that we use the vinyl sticker is you to make gold electrodes. <clears throat> so these gold electrodes are made uh, by making vinyl, we make uh, vinyl sticker masks for the design of the electrode. And then we put the gold leaf uh, with the double-sided tape on top of that mask. And then we cut the design uh, of the electrode uh, onto the mask. And then we peel off the vinyl, uh, we peel off the vi vinyl sticker mask to realize our gold electrodes. And then the individual layers are laminated uh, to form a complete microfluidic biosensor. So the way it works is that uh, we have these three uh, different layers. So the first one is the gold electrode. Uh, so these are gold working and counter electrodes. We have our microfluidic channels uh, made with the iron on sticker layer. And so our silver reference electrodes. Um, we align them. Uh, there, there are many ways to align uh, different individual laminated layers. Uh, I like to use uh, pin headers because uh, the, it, this is a bit more, this is uh, straightforward. Um, so we align them, we tape, and then we laminate uh, through the laminating machine. So it forms a device, uh, it, it forms a laminated device, and then we dice. Uh, the layers into individual sensors, and then we get an individual sensor. Uh, this is uh, size. This is the scale uh, size of the sensor relative to a fifty cent device. So this is, it's act, it's actually really small. And then we validate it. Uh, we wanted to see if that device actually works. So we did some experiments. Uh, our device, uh, we, we did ferrocyanide cyclic voltammetry to show that uh, our in-house fabricated sensor can perform at 70% peak output compared to uh, commercial sensors. Here we use DropSense uh, gold electrodes as reference, but it's also 35 times uh, cheaper than the screen printed gold electrode. Then we also demonstrated uh, uh, then that we can get a linear calibration curve uh, for quantitative measurement of hydrogen peroxide. The sample volume uh, of this uh, measurement was actually uh, was smaller than two microliters. So our sample vol volume was two microliters, um, and that it, so in this device, the microfluidic part. Um, the role of the microfluidic part is to perform volume metering. What volume metering is? Oh, my zoom is lost. Okay, it's still here. Sorry. Uh, so the volume metering, uh, what that is, is that regardless how much uh, volume it will measure out of, uh, it will always perform two microliters. Um, there are more uh, validation work that we are still performing uh, currently. Um, so this project, by the numbers, um, the total cost to set up the project, uh, uh, the two equipments plus minimum order of materials uh, is about RM2100. Uh, minimum order of materials is important because uh, when, when a lot of their seats and they use low cost techniques. Sometimes they use uh, proprietary materials and proprietary materials, uh, even though you only use maybe uh, like 10 cents worth of material, when you buy them up front, uh, often you have to buy uh, in uh, hundreds of ringgits or thousands of ringgits worth. Uh, typically say if you wanna buy a tape, a roll of tape, Sometimes you have to buy uh, 50 meters instead of just like a small roll of tape. So, so in this project, we worked on getting, uh, we, we accounted for a minimum order of materials as well to get the project setup cost. The device cost per unit is about uh, 48 cents per sensor. And the fabrication process time uh, is 
takes one to two and a half hours. So this is compared to methods, uh, for example, if you use uh, photo UV photolithography in clean rooms, this might take uh, this might take up to six hours, uh, depending on the process. Uh, this pro uh, the process that we develop. Uh, the specification for minimum sizes, uh, we can make uh, gold electrodes as small as 450 microns, we can make silver electrodes as small as 550 microns, um, and also uh, microfluid channels uh, as small as 300 microns in width. So how does this project benefit us? Uh, first, uh, we have now develop a cheap, fast, and accessible approach to prototype a common type of biosensor. So it's cheap uh, relative to most uh, uh, relative to most te uh, techniques that requires uh, a significant investment out of from the researcher's side. Um, it's fast because uh, you can make it in under two hours. Uh, accessible because most of the, I, I would say, all of the items that we used, uh, we bought it from uh, Lazada or Shopee. So that's one thing that uh, we, we can brag about. <laughs> um, but the significance of this project is uh, we, we, are a, uh, we hope that we were able to lower access barriers to uh, researchers and developers uh, to, explore, to explore biosensors chemical sensors and microfluidics, even when uh, the budget is uh, limited. So, so hopefully people who, uh, who are not familiar with eye sensors or microfluidics would like to try about uh, working with uh, these fields uh, could have uh, an easier access to this field. And also we make electrochemistry and microfluidics education more accessible uh, at the school or college level. Um, that's it from me. Uh, thank you. Uh, please ask me questions if you have questions for me. Uh, you can contact me uh, at uh, my email or uh, you can tweet to me on Twitter. Thank you. All right. Oh, excellent, Afi. Excellent, excellent work. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was a bit nervous today. I haven't lectured for a really long time. So. <laughs> I mean, your your research is is very interesting. Yeah? When we're talking Thank about false techniques, it's definitely something to think about uh, nowadays, especially. So, question from the floor? <laughs> no floor, but <laughs> virtual floor. <laughs> yeah, so this is new to us, uh, of course. <laughs> so, question. Thank you. Thank you. Jaffa. Uh, Jaffa from UPM. I uh, yes. just want to ask you, uh, for your microfluidic that you develop, uh -huh. uh, for the sample flow through the microfluid, is it you use uh, just capillary reaction or you use any micro pump? Uh, so far, uh, just uh, capillary reaction. Capillary reaction, okay. okay. Yes, because uh, like, like, so, so right now we, we are just going, we just want to do a proof of concept of the fabric.